While much of the West has been punishing Russia for invading Ukraine, many other countries are not following suit. In fact, when global leaders voted to suspend Russia from the UN Human Rights Council, countries representing about three quarters of the world's population did not go along. That's according to USA Today, which also noted that the nations either siding with Russia or abstaining from involving themselves in the conflict are diverse and their motivations are complex. Some are massive nations such as China and India with calculated geopolitical strategies. Some are Russian sympathizers with leaders who stand to benefit from a Kremlin victory. And many are less wealthy countries, often without a strong democratic government that feel trapped between the ideological battles of two superpowers. Time now for the exchange and a deeper look at why many countries have decided not to punish Russia. Joining me live now is Parag Khanna, a former senior advisor at the U.S. Defense Department. Parag, thank you so much for being with us. So there are just under 200 countries in the world. Most of them, as I pointed out, at least according to that USA Today article, have refused to take a concrete stand in this war, either against Rush Russia or for Russia. But there are a lot of countries that actually do actively support Russia. The number of countries that actively support Ukraine are actually surprisingly in the minority. Why do you think that is? Well, first of all, I don't think that it should really be a numerical, you know, accounting exercise of how many supporters does Russia have versus how many does Ukraine have. There's no question that even in countries where the leadership and the government is officially taking a position where it abstains from criticizing Russia or where it's perhaps an ally commercially or geopolitically of Russia, there will still be a strong sympathy for what has happened in Ukraine. And also, of course, some countries, quite frankly, matter more than others in terms of the weight of their vote and of their position. For example, as you mentioned at the beginning, China and India. So rather than doing kind of the counting exercise, I think what's more interesting, as you also pointed out, is the range of countries around the world that Russia has cultivated, built relationships with, has trade or military agreements with. That does include, of course, indeed, uh, China, India, uh, African countries, Latin American countries. And it is that geographical breadth and range of types of government, whether it's authoritarian, or democratic societies that because of those historical or current relations with Russia are more or less, quote unquote, taking that side. So you point out the sort of economic reasons, the sort of military reasons why some countries might be inclined uh, to support Russia. In this USA Today article, Joel Shannon, the author of this article, says that um, there might be ideological reasons as well, because some countries, in his view, um, have a sort of deep resentment for America's history of uh, political and military intervention. Do you believe that in addition to sort of economic and military reasons, there are also ideological reasons why some countries choose uh, not to support uh, Ukraine in this? Well, I don't think we should lump everything under the term ideology. So, for example, what you're referring to is history not necessarily mm -hmm. just ideology. There are countries that, of course, that have very valid historical reasons from their own experience to be suspicious of colonial interventions or Western mm -hmm. powers because of the history of colonialism, Cold War interventions, dealings with uh, odious governments and so forth. And that's perfectly legitimate as a historical reflection and cause for suspicion. Ideology would be if a country says, you know, we are a fellow like-minded authoritarian state we support authoritarian regimes as a matter of principle and therefore we believe that what russia is doing in terms of violating the sovereignty of other countries and you know forcibly subjugating them and trying to dismember the state that is legitimate for that reason that would be ideological mm -hmm. it's ironically perhaps even the countries uh that may sort of or you know sort of support what putin is doing or at least not condemn it uh like china have their own concerns about the territorial integrity of their states. So there is obviously an irony in that position. But I would hesitate to say ideology, again, simply because there are countries that are democratic societies, uh, places mm -hmm. like India, even if the government is leaning towards illiberalism, that uh, that are, again, would be you would lump into the so-called ideology, but then the, the model would fall apart. So it really is very much just about the national interest. And as you again, you pointed out, it can be a geopolitical interest or an mm -hmm. economic interest. Countries that are buying a lot of oil from Russia, countries that are buying a lot of food from Russia, countries that simply, even if they're not, as you've widely reported as well at CNN, 
the supply chain effects in agriculture, fertilizer, and so forth, have these rippling, cascading effects through global supply chains and are making life very difficult for ordinary citizens and consumers all over the world in some of the poorest countries in the world that are already struggling with COVID. So it's very difficult mm -hmm. to separate some of these grand issues that are that are challenging societies. And therefore, um, I don't want to make it a matter of ideology to say that they're really just right, so concerned it's, it's about their own survival. Yeah. So it's much more nuanced than that. Just sort of quickly, my final question. Absolutely. And that, that is, you know, the United States and Western Europe see this war as very black and white. There's obviously a clear aggressor and basically a clear victim in this war. Um, there are many countries for whom you know, the, the broad consensus as to who is to blame and who is the aggressor and who is the, vi the victim is a bit more nuanced than that. Just, just walk us through that. There is in the sense that there, there's a couple of uh, things to unpack there. I know we're running out of time, but, uh, you know, the fact is that Russia and Ukraine have had these sort of unsettled borders for quite a while. And so there is a perspective, certainly in the Russian leaning camp, uh, that these borders were not settled and need to be settled. And if you know Russia has taken this aggressive approach, there is some justification for that. Obviously, that's not a position that uh, that one at least I certainly don't sympathize with, uh, but it's it's out there. Uh, but I think we'll probably have to leave it at that for now. <laughs> yeah, we are. You've obviously been on TV before. We are running out of time. All right. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it.